All right, so tonight we'll be in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And while you're turning and finding Romans chapter 8, Romans is a book that Paul wrote, okay? And Romans is probably Paul's greatest work of any of the books that he wrote. And he wrote half the New Testament. And Romans is the pinnacle, that's the peak of his work. You know, as a biblical scholar, as somebody you're like, I want to study, you could spend a lifetime studying Romans and never really exhaust the depth of its theological underpinnings. There are parts of it that are just crazy deep, and it's amazing. A lot of biblical scholars have called it the gospel according to Paul. In the sense of, you know, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but as important in terms of theology, as important as our understanding of what it means to be a Christian, as important as those four books are, Romans is also important. The key differentiator being that the Gospels have the words of Christ. Nothing is more important, you know, if you're like, What are the most important words in the Bible? That would be the words of Jesus. That would be the words of the living God who took flesh, the one who Micah wrote, but from you, Bethlehem of Rethra, you are too small to be counted among the clans of Judah, but from you one will come forth whose goings are from eternity past. From you one will be born who is from eternity past. Referring to Christ, the God-man, the eternal creator being born. From eternity past yet born. It was a prophecy predicted 700 years before the birth of Messiah. And the words of Christ are the most important in the Bible because you are literally listening to the Word. Jesus is the Word. He is the Word of God incarnate in flesh. And so obviously nothing is more important. But every word of the Bible is inspired and God-breathed. And right underneath those Gospels, right underneath what, what's, what else do I want to learn and really focus on? I want to know what Paul wrote in Romans. Because Romans is so much more than what it takes to know the Lord. Romans is about how to live that life in victory for the Lord. What does it really mean to live as a Christian? What does it mean to live as somebody who has been sanctified, who has been saved, who has been washed clean of their sins? What does that life look like? How do I live that life? How do I walk in victory? How do I deal with temptation? Paul writes about all of these things. He talks about his great desire to save people, his willingness even. He prays at one point in Romans, Lord, I would surrender my salvation if only the Jewish nation would come to see you. He was literally, that is how much he loved the lost. That he actually would be willing to trade his salvation and be condemned for an eternity if it would mean others would come to know the Lord. That's love. Imagine having so much love for the lost. People you don't even know. People that have tried to kill you. By this point in Romans, he has been stoned, he has been beaten, he has been flogged, he has been run out of towns, he has suffered and he has bled for the sake of the gospel. And after all of that, he writes, I would surrender my salvation if it meant they would come to the Lord. Imagine having that kind of love for your neighbor. I don't even know how to, I I can't even begin to fully grasp that because I don't have that kind of love for my neighbor. I wish I did. I pray and hope that as I grow in the Lord that maybe one day I will. My heart breaks for the lost. I see people that are struggling and I feel great sadness inside, but I've never once thought to myself I would trade. Because I'm so grateful to be that broken hearted. And it 
is the heart of Christ speaking through Paul. It's the heart of a man who hung on a cross and said, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Imagine having a mob in a frenzy run you to an authority figure, run you through a show trial, if you could even call it that, while you are as innocent as a pure lamb, and at the end of it to be beaten and flogged within an inch of your life, and then to carry a cross, and then to be nailed to it, and at the end of that experience to look at that same crowd that shouted crucify, and go, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's love that is unfathomable. That's the love that Jesus has for you. That's the love that Paul is showing in Romans. Romans is about what does it mean to live as the redeemed. What does sanctification look like? It's so much more than just this is how you get saved. That is there. That is absolutely the foundation of Romans is, hey, what does it take to know the Lord? And that is step number one. But once you get to the cross, once you accept Christ as Savior, once you ask for forgiveness, you got a whole long runway, God willing, ahead of you you got a whole lot of life left to live. Where do you go from here? What do you do from here? What, what, do you, what, what differences does your life have going forward from where it was? How radically can it be transformed? It can be transformed so radically that you can't even imagine the transformation. It can be changed so unbelievably that you become unrecognizable to the people that used to know you, God willing. That's what you want. That's the type of transformation that we're after. The kind that you go, I don't even know who you are anymore. Praise the Lord. Because that's a heart set on God. I don't want to recognize my old self in me. I don't want to recognize my previous desires in me. I want to recognize Jesus in me. And I want every day for there to be more of it. And ultimately, only God can judge you. And the world will despise you for it because they won't understand it. They won't get it. They'll think you're crazy. They'll mock you for it. They'll despise you for it. They'll make fun of you for it because their minds are set on death. They have different values and different priorities and your values and priorities will inherently be in conflict to their values and priorities. You know, in Proverbs chapter 12, it opens up, it says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. But he who hates reproof, he who hates correction, is stupid. Older translations are even harsher. They've softened it up a little bit because, you know, it's hard to, you know, be that bold. But yeah, a fool. You go back to the 70s and they'll just call you stupid. That's what mine says. He who hates reproof is stupid. Doesn't get any more bold than that. And I need to hear that sometimes. Right, right. I need to hear that. I don't, you know, fool. Well, maybe I'm not a fool. You're stupid. Yeah, I need to hear that sometimes. Because we all have that tendency. But the world hates correction. They hate being told what they're doing is wrong. And their values are different. And you can't measure yourself by their values. You can't measure yourself by society's <coughs> worth because you're using the wrong scale. You're using the wrong measuring rod. And they don't know your worth and they don't understand your worth. And when you go to people and ask them to evaluate your worth and they don't understand what they're evaluating, they're going to undervalue it every time. 
you know, if I bring a beautiful high-end Rolex or Patek Philippe wristwatch, and I go, I want to sell my Patek. So let me go to a pawn shop on Lamar and see what they'll give me for it. $20. Right. I've brought it to the wrong place that has the wrong scale, that's using the wrong criteria to evaluate it. They don't know its worth, they don't know what it is, and they don't understand what it should be worth. And so they apply their scale to it. And their scale, they might have an idea, but they might not really know. They just know it's expensive. But they're never going to be fair. Or maybe I bring a brand they've never heard of. You know, maybe I bring one that is worth a lot, but it's rare and it's old. And they just look at it and see an old watch. You know, maybe I bring them a first edition railroad conductor's pocket watch from the early 1800s. It's not running anymore. And they just look at it and they go, that's an old beat up pocket watch. They don't know that restored it would spark a biddings war at Sotheby's. They don't know it's worth because they're not collectors. They don't know the value. And so they apply their value scale to it. You're no different. If you ask the world to evaluate your worth, they're going to apply the world's value scale to you. They're not going to look at how much you've loved one another. They're not going to look at what you've done for Jesus. They're not going to look at how you've served. They're going to go, well, what kind of house do you have? Do you have more than one? How big is your house? Oh, you just have a starter home. Oh, you don't have a pool, do you? No, no pool? Oh, you do have a pool. In ground or above ground? Oh, you just got an above ground. Oh, okay. You got one of them Walmart pools. All right. What kind of car you drive? Paid for? No? All they're going to do is apply the things that they see as being valuable that the world has told them that is valuable, that Satan has made them believe are valuable. And we assign worth based on those things in society. But do they really matter? Who cares if you have access to a private plane? If you die separated from God and you've never done one valuable thing to help anybody else in your life. Because one day you will be dead, your money will be in somebody else's hand, and nobody will even remember that you existed. And sitting in that fancy leather and going to some exotic destination will not matter when you stand before the Lord. And you will have spent your entire life chasing things of no value. Just like that worthless paper we were joking about a few minutes ago versus a pizza in an exotic destination. If I'm going to parachute into some remote village in the middle of nowhere, send me there with a delicious pizza and not American money that they've never seen before. It doesn't have any real value. You have real, true, intrinsic value if you know the Lord. But if you ask people that don't know the Lord what your value is, they're not going to give you any value. And if you listen to those people about your value, you are not going to feel valued. The only determiner of your value is the Lord. And the only way that you will know what you are doing, that you are serving the Lord, is by praying and reading and having a relationship with the Lord. And then being obedient to Him. Because everybody else has a mindset on death. You know, a little earlier in Proverbs, it says, Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting 
at my doorposts. How happy is what blessed means there, literally happy. How happy is the man who sits and waits on the Lord, waiting at his gates, looking at his doorposts. For he, he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me injures himself. Those that turn against the Lord, who sin against the Lord, they literally injure themselves. You think that you're doing good, but you're literally hurting yourself. All those who hate me love death. When you don't love the Lord, when you don't serve the Lord, when you don't look to honor the Lord, when you have a mind focused on the world, when you value the things of the world, the truth of it, the reality of it, is that you love death. That you're injuring yourself. The world will never see that and understand it apart from Christ. But as you embark on a new life, as you start walking down the path, you have to understand that if you spend time around the people that you used to spend time around that have the values that they used to have, that your time needs to be spent witnessing. Not hanging out and seeking to have encouragement and a friendship with them because they're not going to value the things you value. Their mind is set on injury. You have to have a mind set on life. They're not compatible with each other. Just like Jesus said, dark and light cannot what? They can't coexist. The light drives out the darkness. They don't, they're not mutually compatible. And so where you go when you know the Lord is that you have to have a mind set on God. And Paul talks about this in chapter 8. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Exactly. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's what we were being governed by. The law of sin and death. That's what I was being governed by before I knew the Lord. Try to do good for a little while, make some terrible mistakes. Wake up in the morning and go, what did I do? I'm not going to do that again. A week later, I was doing it again. Maybe a week. You know, if it was a really bad night. Might be enough to wait a week. Might not be. Just depends. And there you are, in a cycle of death and sin. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Amen. The law's purpose was to point out your sin. That's what all the laws in the Old Testament are about. This is the perfect standard. This is what is holy. And by the end of reading it, you can say, I'm going to try to do that, and as they did, they tried. But every year, every day, every minute, they would come up short because it was an impossible standard. And in the end, the standard wasn't achievable, but what the standard did was say, to you, I can't do this without you, God. It's so the point of the law is to point out that you can't do it apart from Him. I need His mercy because this isn't doable. I need help. You know, if we get on a plane tomorrow and we all show up at Mount Everest and they hand you the climbing equipment, how many of you are getting up there? There's not one of you in this room that's getting up there. Okay? Even some of you skinny, healthy-looking ones, you ain't getting up there. 
There's a lot of skinny looking healthy ones that are dead on the side of the mountain that they don't even bring down. They're just laying out there, okay? Right. They don't even, you die up there, they don't even bring you down. It's too hard to get your body and bring it down. They just lay you there. You walk past bodies on the way up. There's hundreds of them up there. All right? We go down there and you go, hey, climb it. I'm going to look at that mountain and go, I cannot do that, Lord. That's what the law is for us. It's like looking at Mount Everest and going, eh, it's not achievable. There's not a one of us in here that could climb up Mount Everest tomorrow. May as well ask you to, you know, and following the law is an even harder standard. It's even harder than that. It's impossible. But it makes us realize that apart from a miracle, I'd look at that mountain and go, well, I need a miracle. Lord, unless you miracle me up there, I'm not getting up there. Now, Jesus, if you come and you say, hey, walk beside me, and you're going to miracle me up there, great, let's climb. But short of that, I'm not getting up that mountain. I'm not even going to take a step out. Why bother? Might fall. Just stay right here at base camp. I'm not going nowhere. Why even start? And the law can feel that way when you read it. You're like, oh, I can't do this. And we all know what's right and wrong. It was written in our hearts. Even before you ever picked up a Bible, you knew what was right and wrong. You knew it was wrong to steal from people. You know it's wrong to kill people. You know it's wrong to lie. You know that these things are obviously wrong. You don't need somebody to tell you it. Because the Lord wrote it in your heart. And so Paul writes, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He appeared as a man. In the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He served as a substitute. There has to be a penalty for sin. Jesus took your penalty as a substitute. In order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Once you know Jesus, you walk with Jesus. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. All those who hate me love death. It's a fancy way of saying it. Proverbs makes it simple. He who hates reproof is stupid. Paul writes it much nicer. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. All those who love me find favor. For the mindset on the flesh is death. All those who hate me love death. Same message. <coughs> but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Apart from knowing the Lord, you cannot please God. There's nothing you can offer. All your good deeds are like filthy rags before the Lord. All of you have sinned. There is not one righteous, not one. Apart from Jesus, there is nothing you can do to get your way to the Lord. There is no other way. There is no earning it. There is no good enough because you have sin in you and you are dealing with a holy and perfect God and you cannot meet that standard. None of us can. That's why he sent his son to die. However, you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Amen. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells in you. There is life in Jesus. Amen. There is eternal life in Jesus. If you have your mind set on Christ, you have to focus on the things of life and not 
the things of death. Let's pray. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Lord, thank you for tonight. Oh Lord, I just lift these warriors up to you, Father. Lord, I pray that you would fill them with your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would help them on the path to draw to you, to seek you, to obey you, to walk with you, Lord, to have their minds focused on you, to turn their minds from the thoughts of the flesh and turn their minds solely to you and to seek you with every thought and every breath. Lord, I pray tonight if there's a man here who doesn't know you, that tonight would be the night, Lord, that they would come to you. That tonight would be the night that as we have our heads bowed, they would just pray, Dear Lord, I am a sinner. And I have broken your law. I can't meet your standard. I need you, Lord. Please forgive me. Tonight I confess that you sent your son as a substitute for me. That Jesus paid my penalty. And that he rose again from the dead and he is alive. And so tonight, Jesus, I give you my life. And I ask you to save me. I ask you to forgive me. Lord, help me and lead me down your path. I will obey and follow you wherever you tell me to go. Help me, Lord, to live for you and you alone all the days of my life. Oh, Father, I just pray that you would pour your spirit out on the Warrior Center. Lord, I pray a hedge of protection around this building. I pray that you would give your angels charge concerning this place, that the enemy would not be granted a threshold here. Lord, that you would send the enemy far from here, that you would drive him out, that you would say this is a place where the Lord dwells. And that here, Lord, your spirit would be poured out and that these men would seek you and that they would know you and that they would be filled with your spirit, Lord, and that from here, revival would come. That these men would serve as a testimony to every person they meet about the power you have to transform lives and to perform <clears throat> miracles. And that you today are still in the miracle business. Oh, Lord, I just pray that you would lift these men up, Lord, and that you would make them amazing testimonies for you. In the sweet, matchless name of Jesus, the Messiah, I pray. Amen. Amen.